Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. If you've not already, I do encourage you to check out my ebooks, All I Needed to Know I Learned from Columbo, and All I Needed to Know I Learned from Dragnet. These ebooks examine the careers and histories of seven great fictional detectives and policemen, as well as life lessons that can be learned from them. They are available wherever fine ebooks are sold or as an audiobook through the Apple Store or Audible.com. And you can find all my books, audiobooks, and ebooks over at store.greatdetectives.net. Well, I have a bit of a surprise. There were a few episodes from earlier in the run of Philo Vance that I did not believe we would be able to play for you. However, I've acquired the episodes, and so we are going to be going back in out of chronological order for the next four weeks. And this episode comes from the first run of Philo Vance episodes that were broadcast in 1946 and 47. The original air date on this particular program was January 16th, 1947, and the title is The Best Seller Murder Case. Hey, look where you're driving. I'm sorry. Oh, it's you, Georgia. You realize you almost ran me down? I'm sorry, Hartley. I was preoccupied. I I was thinking about... It might be an idea to reserve your thinking for a time when you're not driving your car. You're sure, of course, you weren't aiming it at me. No. No, I'm not sure. I didn't think you were. Hartley, I hadn't meant to talk to you again, to beg you again. But I've got to. I've got to know your decision. About the book I'm writing? I'm going to finish it, of course. You understand what that'll mean to my life? My book isn't your biography, darling. It'll only seem as if it is, and only to a few hundred people. The ones you know best. Some of whom provided me with all the details. Hartley, I'm warning you. Don't finish that book. Why not? It's bound to be a bestseller. I've told my publisher I'd deliver it next week. He's contracted to publish it. Of course, you could go see him. Maybe he'd listen to you. Hartley... If I told my husband... That I was finishing a book about your past? Couldn't very well do that without incriminating yourself, could you? (sighs) Oh, uh, incidentally, if you should like to speak to my publisher, I saw the venerable Mr. Milton Green go by a few minutes ago. Just go past your house and there's his. One big unhappy community. How I wish I'd never seen you. Uh, The eternal female, you censure yourself, not for your indiscretions, but because I know about them. You know, come to think of it, those three houses have a wonderful story to tell. Mine, yours, and my publishers. Identical houses, but the lives of the occupants. <laughs> are different. I'm asking you, Hartley, not to finish that book you're writing. And I'm telling you, I will. It'll make a fortune for me. And please be careful with that car of yours. Next time, perhaps I won't be as lucky as I was a few minutes ago. That's right, Hartley. Next time, you might not be so lucky at that. Stuart, I'm ready, sir, whenever you'd like to continue dictating. I'm ready now, Maines. Read me the last few lines I've dictated. Bring me up to the action. Hmm. Here it is. When we left off this afternoon, you had your leading feminine character about to convince the theatrical producer that she ought to be the star of his next play. And the last line was a speech of hers. It said, 
We could discuss this so much better in my apartment, Mr. Andrego. Oh, yes. Uh, new chapter, Mains. Yes, sir. Diana's apartment was a triumph of the decorator's art. Triumph. The living room was a combination of subtlety, taste, and uh, purpose. Three characteristics of Diana herself. Yes, sir. A maroon... Stuart, I want to talk to you. Well, Captain Bailey. Yes, Captain Bailey. Stuart, tell this cabin boy to get aft. Huh? Uh, Captain Bailey means he'd like to see me alone. It's perfectly all right, Mains. Wait in the next room while I call you. Yes, sir. I'll wait until you want to. Well, he's gone, Captain. Only I'd much prefer it were you that went. What is it you want? Well? Mr. Stewart, I've been to sea 17 years. Worked myself up from able-bodied seaman to captain, and it was tough work. Only now I'm glad I did it. Well, if you're glad, I'm glad. And now, sir, will you leave? I just told you that so you'd believe what I'm going to say. Mr. Stewart, there's only one soft spot in me, and that's my wife. I saw her outside a little while ago. Yes, she told me. And she told me you're responsible for making her unhappy. I don't know how and I don't know why. All I know is you're not going to do it. Keeping my wife happy is more important to me than my life. And much more important to me than yours. What was that? Who's there? Who's there? Put on that... Ah! Yes, Ellen? Don't look now, but I think someone's following us. Really? How do you know? A while back when I stopped to powder my nose, I noticed a man in back of us. I saw him in my compact mirror. And you saw the same man when we turned the corner just now. So did I. That's nothing to be concerned about. According to you, there's nothing ever to be concerned about. Maybe whoever it is won't know that I'm only the brilliant Philo Vance's secretary. Maybe they'll think I know whatever it is they're after. I think we ought to start running. Well, this seems a little foolish to me, but I'll affect a slight compromise. We'll walk a little faster. Well, that's great, but he's walking faster, too. Vance, let's really move. Hey there, you too. He's calling us, Vance. Come on, this is no time for logic. He looked awfully tough in that mirror. Ellen, there are things I do for you I never will be able to explain. I haven't run like this since I left college. I have. I've been running after you for years. Vance, he's gaining on us. Hey, both of you, stop. Stop, I tell you. He's liable to shoot at his bat. That is all I wanted to hear. We're waiting right in this spot, Ellen. A bullet could travel faster than we. Well, quite a chase you two gave me just now. It wasn't really our best. May I ask what it is you want? Look, you, if there's anything you want... I'm a police officer, Riley, third precinct, plain clothes. You call those plain? Well, in that case, good evening, officer. You want me? I'm Philo Vance. I know you're Philo Vance. At least I thought you were. Anyway, I followed you to make sure. Then when I see you heading towards your apartment house just now, I know. Look, Mr. Vance, the reason I tell you... I think I know, officer. District Attorney Markham wants to see me and couldn't reach me on the telephone. There's probably been a murder. What do you mean, probably? Hey, there was a murder, Vance. A guy who writes books, name was Hartley Stewart. And I'm supposed to get you to the murder house with a police escort. Well, that's it, Vance. Sorry to have had to call out the police to reach you, but there was no other way. I understand, Markham. I'm glad you did reach me. Hartley Stewart lived in this house. Yes. And the Baileys, the sea captain and his wife I told you about, live right next door. The Baileys, eh? Just let me go over this once again, Markham. Sure, Vance. Now, Sergeant Heath found typewritten pages of the unfinished novel on which Stewart was working. And you found an inscription on the first page that read, To Georgia Bailey, without whom this story would have been impossible to tell. That's right. I, uh, glanced through the pages... And it's pretty evident that Mrs. Bailey would never want that novel finished, believe me. Mm -hmm. That's why I have her and her husband in the murder house waiting for you. I'm glad you have, Markham. Now, let's see. There are three identical houses in a row. The murdered man's, the Bailey's, and a third one. Who lives in that? Mr. Stewart's publisher, a man named Milton Green. I've sent for him. He ought to be along any minute now. From what you've told me, Markham, this shouldn't be too difficult a case. I could see motives lying around in abundance. 
And this should be our publisher, Mr. Green, I imagine. Your imagination most often surpasses anyone else's knowledge, Vance. Uh, Mr. Green? Yes, yes, I'm Green. Who are you? I'm Markham, district attorney. Uh, this is Philo Vance. Eh? We thought that you, as Mr. Stewart's publisher, would be able to give us some information. I can't give you any information. Can't give you anything. I'm a sick man. Policeman woke me up. Why me? What can I tell you? We're not sure, Mr. Green. Sometimes, though, it's people who try to tell us nothing that actually tell us everything we want to know. <laughs> This is fine. No gun, no fingerprints, no nothing. Oh, hello, Mr. Markham. Hello, Sergeant Heath. What were you saying? No, I was saying no gun, no fingerprints, no nothing. Not a clue. Of course, we haven't really gone to work on this room yet. Haven't had time, but Good I'm... Good evening, Heath. Oh, it's you, Vance. Well, at least we got something on this case. You. Thank you, Heath. That's very kind of you. I just interviewed your suspects, by the way... Captain and Mrs. Bailey, Milton Green, and Mr. Stewart's secretary, Gregory Maines. Well, Maines ain't a suspect. He had no reason to kill his boss. Heath, I'm surprised at you. The mere fact that a person is one's employer might be a motive to a certain type of individual. Yeah? So this is the murder room. Yes, apparently Stewart was shot as he lay in bed, Vance. I see. Powder marks, Heath? Nope, none. The lights were out. The murderer must have fired in the dark. Quite a lovely bedroom, this. What's over at that side of the room, Vance? The bed's on this side. Yes, I know. Oh, Sergeant Heath, how many bullets would you say were fired? One. Just one. And it got Stuart in the heart. I think you'll find there were two. Hmm? That one is embedded in the wall over there. The wall I was looking at. There's a bit of plaster and fresh paint in one small spot. I think you'll find a bullet underneath it. Vance, you're incredible. Yeah, maybe he is, maybe he ain't. Maybe there won't be any bullet under that plaster. I'm going to look. Don't take any bows yet, Vance. I won't. And perhaps there won't be any bullet there. My reasoning was purely hypothetical. By the way, Markham, who found the body? Hartley Stewart's secretary, Gregory Maines. And he called headquarters right away. There goes Heath scraping away. You say Maines called headquarters immediately. Well, maybe so... But while I was talking to him downstairs, I noticed a strong odor of turpentine. Well, could that be associated with this murder, Vance? Perhaps. I may be able to tell you as soon as Sergeant Heath tells me something. Well, Heath? Uh, there was a bullet in the wall. Somebody covered it with plaster. I uh, heard what you just said, Vance. You think this Maine's guy killed his boss, fired a bullet into the wall, and then plastered up the hole? No, I don't, Heath. I don't really think Mr. Maine's did all three of those things. Just one. I think he plastered the bullet hole. But offhand, I can't understand why. You'd better talk to me, Vance. Ask me something. Ask me anything. Just don't sit there and stare at me. I haven't anything to ask you, Maines. I'm waiting for you to tell me something. What? What? You want me to tell you I killed Stuart? I didn't do it. I didn't. All right. How about Mrs. Bailey? How well did you know her? I didn't know her very well. But whenever we'd meet, she was very nice to me. And she's so lovely. I liked her, Vance. Oh? You knew that Mr. Stewart's book would ruin her life? Of course I did. There wasn't anything I could do about it. I needed the job I had. I tried to get Mr. Green to turn down the book, but he said if he didn't take it, some other publisher would. Well, I suppose that's true enough. So you've been at Mr. Green's house, Maines? Yes. And I've been to the Baileys, too. I see. Why did you put plaster over the bullet hole in Mr. Stewart's bedroom? What makes you think I did that? I don't think. I know. You had the opportunity to do it before you called the police. That still doesn't mean I did it. No, it doesn't. But I'll tell you something that does. Smell your hands. Turpentine. That's a hard odor to get rid of. But paint spots are even more difficult. You are clever, aren't you, Vance? Just observing. I think you plastered the bullet hole, painted it, and then used turpentine to remove any evidence of the paint from your hands or clothes. 
And I don't think you fired the bullet that caused the hole you so carefully tried to hide. But why did you try to hide it? Why? Listen, Vance. That bullet hole told me who killed Hartley Stewart. And I knew it would tell the police who did it, too. I didn't want that to happen. I don't want Mr. Stewart's killer to be found. The second bullet hole told you who killed Mr. Stewart, eh? Well, I know this is awful, but it doesn't tell me. Maybe I'm not as clever as you think, Mr. Maines. Or maybe I just haven't talked enough to enough people. <laughs> This is District Attorney Markham. The bestseller murder case began when novelist Hartley Stewart was found shot in his room. Suspects include Stewart's secretary, Gregory Maines, his next-door neighbors, Captain and Mrs. Bailey, and his publisher, Milton Green. Green, the Baileys, and Stewart lived in identical houses on the same street. And our case became complicated when a bullet hole covered with plaster was found at the side of the room exactly opposite Stewart's bed. Ballistics showed that both that bullet and the murder bullet came from the same gun. Vance has allowed the Baileys to return to their home, but he and I are going there in a few minutes. We hope to be... Ed, darling, I am. I'm going to the police and admit I shot Hartley Stewart. Oh, no, you're not, Georgie. You're doing nothing of the kind. I won't let you. You've got to. Sooner or later, they'll know he was writing a book about me. They'll know I couldn't allow that book to be finished. They'll think that either I killed him or you did. I'll tell them I shot him. The skunk didn't deserve to live. I threatened him. That secretary Maines heard me. Now, I'm going to... Who's there? It's District Attorney Markham, Bailey. Vance is with me. Open up. I'm not going to open that door until you promise me you'll say nothing about killing Stuart, Georgie. I won't promise. I can't. That'll mean you'll go to jail. We know you're in there. We can hear your voices. Now, open this door. We don't want to have to break it down. Open it, Ed. Open it, or I will. Not till we have this thing decided, Georgie. I'm going... Ed, nope. Ed, you're hurting my arm. Stop. Let it break it down. What do we care now? Only, Georgie, when they get in, you keep quiet, do you hear? Oh. Let me do the talking. Good evening, Captain Bailey, Mrs. Bailey. Why did you make us break down that door? Why couldn't you have let us in? Maybe we didn't want you in, Markham, or you either, Vance. Sometimes we come into places we don't want to enter either, Bailey. Listen, both of you. I've got my hat spatting down, but a slide will blow any minute. I know what you're here for. Well, that will save us a lot of time, Captain. Okay. You know one of us killed Mr. Stewart. All right, one of us did. But we're both going to confess, and I don't want you to believe her. I killed him, you hear me? I did. No, no, he didn't kill Stuart. I did. Don't listen to him. Don't believe him. He's trying to protect me. She's lying. She knows I did it. Oh. Okay, I did it. Take me in. I'm ready. Ed. I think not, Bailey. I think we'll leave with Mrs. Bailey. Oh, no, you don't. Stay where you are, both of you. Oh. Is that the same gun that shot Stuart, Captain Bailey? What if it is? Please, Ed, put that gun away. This will get us nowhere. Get some things together, honey. Go ahead. Work fast. We'll be out of here before anyone knows we're gone or where we're going. I won't let him take you. Hurry. Ed, I want that gun. Do like I tell you, Georgie. Get some stuff stowed. Hurry. Ed, give me that gun. Give it to no, me. No, no. This is our one chance. Can't you see that? Get away from me. Give it to me, Ed. Running away won't help. Give me the gun. Your wife's being intelligent about this, Captain Bailey. Ed. Here's the gun, Georgie. That's being sensible, darling. I was only trying to... I know, dear, and, and I love you for it. Well... I'm ready, gentlemen. Are we ready, Vance? Not quite. Mrs. Bailey, would you and Captain Bailey show me your bedroom? What? Well, you may see it if you like, Mr. Vance. But why? Vance has a reason, I promise you that. May we see it? Well, it's just up at the head of the stairs. We'll be here when you get down. At the head of the stairs. Same as Mr. Stewart's? All these houses are the same. That's what I thought. Come on, Markham. It... Don't please get hold of Vance, these houses are all the same. Why do you want to look at the Bailey bedroom? You won't believe me if I say it's just curiosity? No. I'm glad, because it isn't that at all. I didn't think it was. Well, there's the bedroom door. Hmm. Very interesting room. Fitted out like a captain's cabin. Does that mean anything? No, but the bed's in the same corner of the room as Mr. Stewart's bed was. That does mean something. Forgive me for not knowing what. Oh, it's nothing terribly important, Markham. 
merely tells me two other people who didn't kill Hartley Stewart. Well, Mike, what goes? Any activity inside the house? No, Sergeant Heath. I've been here watching the place like you asked me to. Only old man Green hasn't set a foot out of his house. Good. I've got to keep him cooped up. Hey, Heath, huh? take a look in the garage back there. The door's open. Somebody started the car in there. It's probably Green. He's trying to get away. Come on. Where are you, Mike? I'm coming, Sergeant. And you better duck. Huh? Here comes that guy Green and his roadster. Hop out of the way. Around the running board. Hey, you in that car? Stop. Stop, I said. The running board, Heath. Right. Get off. Now, get now, look, you, when I say stop, I mean well, stop, and right off. now. Go away. Don't try to stop well, me. Mr. I've got Green to get away. looks like I'll have to stop this little kitty car by no. turning the ignition off. Oh, get your hand out of me. There. Oh, no. what are you doing? Where were you running to, uh, Mr. Green? Uh, you knew you weren't supposed to leave your house. You knew that, didn't you? Yes, yes, I knew it, but I couldn't help it. I, I've got to get away from here, this house, the street, everything about it. I'm a sick man, Sergeant Heath. I've got to get away from here. I'll die. I'm sick. I'm sick. Oh. Hey. Hey, Mike. Come on over here. Hurry. This guy Green's collapsed. You can go in now, Vance. Only the doctor says there isn't much anybody can do for him. Fine thing I'm doing, playing nursemaid to a guy that's dying while a murderer is loose somewhere. It's your good turn for today, Heath. Maybe you'll get a merit badge for it. Hmm, sure, sure. Uh, bed's on your left as you come in, Vance. The left? The bed in Stewart's bedroom was on the right. That's where it was in the Bailey boudoir, too. So what? Can a guy put his bed where he wants? Go on in, Vance. He ain't got long, Doc says. I'm sorry to hear that. I'll see you, Heath. Yeah. Wait here for me. Okay. Hello, Mr. Green. Who? Who is that? I... I can't see. It's I, Mr. Green. Philo Vance. Go away. All right. If that's what you want, Mr. Green. No. No, you must stay. Stay here. I... I've got something to tell you, Vance. Something you're going to want to know. It's something I know already, Mr. Green. That's it? I think I know why you killed Hartley Stewart. Do you? Well, you'd... You'd better, because I'll... I'll never tell you. You had to publish his book if he finished it. Yes. Even if you didn't, somebody else would. That's true. You couldn't let that book out on the market because of what it would do to Mrs. Bailey. I couldn't... I couldn't let Stuart finish it. Why, Georgia is the most wonderful. She was just everything. You liked Mrs. Bailey enough not to want her to be hurt. This was the way you selected to make sure that that book Stuart was writing would never get published. There was... nothing else I could do. He was no good, Vance. I know. And I think, Mr. Green, that for once, I'm going to forget that I figured out how a murder was done and who did it. You do, Mr. Vance? You will forget? I think I will, Mr. Green. For now, I think I'll get even more satisfaction from that. Tell me. Tell me how you knew I... I killed Stuart, Vance. No, Mr. Green. Right now, I won't tell the police that you killed him, and I won't tell you how I knew. Vance, you've been strong and silent a lot of times, but you're overdoing it now. I'm sorry, Ellen, I don't have anything to say. But, Vance, you've admitted to me that you've stopped work on the bestseller murder case, but you haven't named the murderer. No, that's right, I haven't. Well, there's got to be a first time for everything. This is it, apparently. Did you strike out, Vance? I imagine so. I'll take that if you don't mind, Vance. I've been expecting a call from Sergeant Heath. By all means, Markham. Hello, Markham speaking. No, Mr. Markham, this is Heath. Well, it happened just ten minutes ago. Mr. Green? Yeah, he's dead. You said to call you, so I'm doing it. 
Still no news on who knocked off Stewart, though. All right, Heath, thank you. Keep me informed, will you? Sure will, D.A. Bye. Bye. Mr. Green's dead, Vance. Oh, that's too bad. Well, Markham, you can ask me any question you like now. It was Green who fired that shot into Stewart and the other one into the wall. It was Green? Poor Vance, why didn't you tell us? I wanted to wait until I found out whether or not Mr. Green would recover from his collapse. Now I can tell you. Green was very fond of Mrs. Bailey in a nice, kindly, fatherly way. He killed Stewart to prevent the novelist from finishing the book that would have ruined Mrs. Bailey. Well, we found out that much anyhow, didn't we, Ellen? That's not enough for me. I've got to know more. For instance, from what I've been told, that second bullet hole in the plaster of Stewart's bedroom gave Vance a clue. How? Well, listen. The bedroom in all three identical houses was in the same place. But inside the bedroom, things were different. When you opened the bedroom door at Mr. Stewart's and the Bailey's house, the bed was on the right. Go ahead, Vance. We're following you. In Mr. Green's bedroom, the bed was on the left as you entered the door. When I saw Mr. Green's room, I knew he was the murderer because the position of his bed accounted for the bullet in the plaster of Mr. Stewart's room. I think I'm getting this now. Green had never been upstairs in Stewart's house. He opened the door. The room was dark, so he fired into a spot where Stewart's bed might have been. Let me get in on this. It so happened that Stewart's bed was on the opposite side, and after the first bullet was fired, he probably sat up in bed and screamed. Green realized his error and fired at the sound of Stewart's voice. Oh, one other thing. The secretary, Mains, plastered the first bullet hole because he'd been to Green's house and knew Green's bed was on the other side of the bedroom. Hence, he was able to figure out the murderer. And try to cover up for him. <laughs> can't hate him for that. No, we can't. Considering that Green's motive was so unselfish, his illness so acute, and Mr. Stewart such a terribly unpleasant individual. Incidentally, it was Mr. Green's illness that prevented me from naming him as the killer. You understand that now, Markham. Of course, Vance. Before you talk, you had to wait until Mr. Green's life was at an end, right, Vance? Yes, I did. I had to wait for that before I could tell you that the bestseller murder case was at an end, too. Welcome back. Well, this is an interesting episode. There are some key hallmarks of early Vance episodes. Sergeant Heath plays a more active role and pushes back more on Vance than he would in later episodes. And in these first 26 episodes, you do tend to have both Sergeant Heath and Ellen in nearly every program. It does seem after the initial run was finished, oftentimes these uh, syndicated programs were produced in blocks, and after this initial block of episodes, the presence of both Ellen and Sergeant Heath become less, with Sergeant Heath in many episodes being entirely off stage. I guess they decided not to recast the roles because they would be sold in packages and it might confuse listeners. So they decided to work around actor availability. Of course, here Sergeant Heath provides pushback. I think after these first 26 episodes, maybe one he provided some token 
pushback to Vance's presence in the case. Other than that, Vance is surprisingly sympathetic for early follow Vance, choosing to let the killer die in pace. It's good as far as it goes from a character angle, yet I think it can be kind of a iffy situation when the detective makes decisions to allow a criminal to get away with it. Although even Sherlock Holmes and Columbo have made similar calls from time to time, taking advantage of their unofficial status to act in what they consider to be justice as opposed to what the law demands. Though, I think it was a little uh, churlish of Vance not to let the dying man know how he found out. I know they were trying to save the explanation for the final scene. They could have just had Vance say, okay, well, I'll tell you, and then cue the music. The solution itself, it does feel a bit contrived. But if you accept the idea of all these people having identical houses, which can happen, although this living situation seems very random and improbable, but if you accept that, I guess that the solution uh, works pretty well. All right, listener comments and feedback now, and we start with YouTube. Ryan Sir wrote, I heard your discussion of Rexall drugstores a week or two ago, and I wanted to tell you there is at least one still in operation. It is in uh, Bradenton, Florida. I'd send you a picture, but I have no idea how to do it. Uh, well, thanks so much for the comment, Ryan Sir. Uh, you can email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. You know, all of your Rexall pictures, uh, if anyone wants to share them, uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, it's fascinating to hear, again, the actual chain Rexall is defunct in the United States, a list, another listener said that they have them up in British Columbia, but that's a separate company, but the brand doesn't exist as, uh, for stores in the United States, uh, it is a brand of drug products sold through Dollar General, uh, but it's fascinating to hear where there are still Rexalls just carrying the sign because they've been Rexall drugstores and that's how people know them and no one's going to complain about them using a chain uh, that's uh, no longer in operation in this country. And another insight, this one uh, uh, comes from a listener... Dr. Frankenstein's Creations, as a property manager in a small town, I can say that, at least in my city, the landlord cannot let police in without a warrant under normal circumstances. We, on the other hand, have a clause in our lease that gives us permission to do so. Unfortunately, we not only had situations that prompted us to discuss this option with the local police, and therefore uh, add that uh, to the clause uh, we've had to use it a couple uh, times. Well, and that definitely makes sense. There are certain things that you don't want folks doing on your property. One example of this is running a meth lab. Uh, when I was in Montana in college, I took the uh, criminalistics and forensics course, and one of the things we had uh, someone come in from local lo law enforcement and discuss was uh, the meth problem and th the topic of how meth labs could absolutely destroy a property and require landlords to spend tens of thousands of dollars in order to be able to rehab it before you can even have another occupant in there. So that alone would be enough, I think, if I were a landlord to have that sort of clause in there. And there are probably even more reasons for a landlord to want that option. Because criminals aren't particularly particular about how they take care of other people's property. Eric writes uh, on Facebook, this isn't about this particular episode, more of a general statement on one of the main things about some old-time radio detective stories that happens quite a bit in Philo Vance. Philo, working for the DA, had a plan to get the killer or knows who the killer is. He goes to the DA. I know who did it. 
how and I have the motive. I have a plan to catch him, but I can't tell you yet. He's the DA. He's your employer. He has resources and can help. I kind of want the DA to go off on him just once. Philo, if you think you know and have evidence, tell me. He's just killed three people. We can get him off the streets. No, not just yet. I have a plan. Great. What's the plan? It's something I have to do myself. Oh, for crying out loud. Well, Eric, I have to say that that's expecting a lot of backbone of Markham, and he hasn't shown this whole series. But the thing to understand is that Markham is not actually Vance's employer. Rather, he's a private detective working independently, not being paid by the city, and therefore can do whatever he wants. So that's why he's not required to tell anything to Markham, because Markham is not the boss of him. Though Markham, I guess, could stop allowing him to uh, work so actively on all of the big murder cases that come into the city, but then all of the murderers would get away because the police in the Philo Vance universe. So you're not wrong that the way that Vance uh, responds to Markham and hides things from him is a problem. It's just probably part of a worse problem that all of the big crimes are being investigated by an unaccountable civilian with the allowance of the police force. But as always, thanks for the comment, Eric. And now let's go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. I want to go ahead and thank Alex, Patreon supporter since August of 2020, currently supporting the program at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Alex. And that will actually do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And if you are enjoying this podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. All those great things that help the channel grow. We will be back next Thursday with another episode of Philo Vance. But join us back here tomorrow for the Forbes Matter, where... Forbes? Forbes? Hey, Forbes, it's me, Johnny Dollar. I want to talk to you. It took me a few seconds to understand what it was. I got a couple of whiffs of it coming from under his door. Forbes! The room was accurate. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.